Ruth. Isn't the Bible amazing how, how well, the, the Bible that we have is actually many books, as we know. And, and sometimes it, it gives the big picture. Great things will be spoken of, which, for example, affect the whole nation of Israel, as in when God delivered them, we redeemed them from slavery in Egypt. And by his mighty power, his outstretched hand, and by great miracles, he did this mighty work, thus revealing his self, himself, his power. In, in, but this affected the whole nation. Or when God uh, thunders his mighty word through his prophets, addressing the whole nation, calling them to return to, to the Lord and to his ways. So sometimes we have the, the, this big picture the word which comes for a, for a whole nation or nations. But sometimes we have, as it were, a zooming in. Closer and closer and closer and closer. Zooming in more and more, to use a term from, from, from photography. You, you know how, how you have yeah, that zooming facility. Well, this is what we have here in the book of Ruth. So imagine yourself kind of at a far distance looking down. Well, if you're far enough, the whole, the entire globe will just be a speck, won't it? And as you come closer and closer, you can make out the outlines of the nations. Okay, and you zoom in closer and closer, and you can make out the nation of Israel. Okay, and keep going, zoom in closer still, and you can focus in on a town called Bethlehem. And keep zooming, and you focus on that little village of Bethlehem, and you come to one family. And our attention here in the book of Ruth is on one particular family and what transpires for this family. So we're zooming in, zooming, zooming in. Sometimes the Bible speaks of great things. Sometimes there's a focus on just a few individuals. But this is placed in a context. When we come to the book of Ruth, we're talking about a particular time in history, a particular place, and a particular family. And you know, if you zoom in on that family, you'll come even down just to one woman. And if you look at the end of the book of Ruth, this woman, whose name is Naomi, is just sitting there, and she's just cuddling a little baby boy. So just picture that. And we've come all this way, we've zoomed, 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 until we just focus on this woman, and in her arms is a baby and there's a big smile on her face because she is filled with joy and holding this little boy whose name is Obed. Just, just rocking him back and forth, cuddling him in her arms. And you can tell by the look on her face that she is filled with joy. But the same woman at the beginning of this book was not in such a state. As we'll see in a moment as we read a few verses, the same woman, Naomi, at the beginning was actually filled with sorrow, she, with grief, and with a, with a deep bitterness in her heart. Now, the book, of, the book of Ruth comes after the book of Judges. And just perhaps recall that the book of Judges is one of the most difficult books to read because it really highlights the sinfulness of human beings. If, if you want to know the depths of sin and depravity of human beings, you'll see it there in the book of Judges. It, it, it is terrible what happens again and again in people's rebellion. It says that everybody did what was right in their own eyes. In other words, they were just living a selfish, independent lives in rebellion against God time and time and time again. This is what we have in the book of Judges. And then after that, hard as it is, we come to the book of Ruth, and it's like a breath of fresh air. One of those... Blasts of fresh air, which is uh, refreshing and uplifting. This is what the book of Ruth is. The book of Ruth, as, even though it is very particular in its focus on this family, and a few women in particular, it actually looks beyond itself. As we look at the book of Ruth, in these minute details of this family, when we come to the end of it, it sort of opens up and points the way to the future. A breath of fresh air. 
One, one writer speaks of the book of Ruth in, in, in these terms. The, the man's name is Barry Webb, so I'll acknowledge him. He's done a very good study on the book of Ruth. But he says this, the overall movement, it, just considering the, these four chapters of the book of Ruth from beginning to end, the overall movement is from death to life, from barrenness to fruitfulness, from emptiness to fullness, and from curse to blessing. He said, that's the movement that we find in this book. Now, let's have, just have a look. Uh, the, the chapter 1 is the setting of the scene for what is to take place. So this drama, there's a, there's a story. The, the writer of this is a master storyteller. He fills in just the details that are needed in the story, and the, and the drama unfolds before us. So let's have a look. The book of Ruth. If you don't have your Bibles, you can just uh, listen carefully as I read. Now it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech and the name of his wife Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion, Ephratites of Bethlehem in Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years. Then both Malone and Chilion also died, and the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. So here we have the scene is set. Notice all the names. All these characters were named specifically, even though uh, three of them were soon to die in a foreign land. But there, there they were in a place called Bethlehem, that would cause any Jewish uh, reader to, or ears to kind of um, pick up and pay attention. But um, there was a famine, as, as we read, and this, the family, husband, wife, two sons, uh, decide to go and live for a while in the land of Moab. Now, we also see that this, this uh, a while stretched out to 10 years. So 10 years away from their own people, their own family, their own land. Uh, and, and remember, they were away from the covenant people of God. And because of this famine and the need, I guess the pressure that the family felt, they had, actually they had children, they go away to the land of Moab, stay there 10 years, during which time Elimelech, the father, dies. And there Naomi was left with their two sons. And what do they do? They both marry two uh, Moabite w um, women, Orpah and Ruth. And then what happens? Tragedy strikes again. The two sons die, as we are told. And then let's continue reading because now we find that there is going to be a returning. A returning. So I'm up to verse uh, 6. Then she, that is Naomi, arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the land of Moab. For she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So just stop for a minute. I'll just make a few comments on the way. Here, this woman, in, in the grip of a tragedy, not only the loss of her husband and the loss of her two sons, but being away from her people. And she would have felt so very alone. But nevertheless, there in that land, she heard that, that God had visited his people, according to, as it doesn't say, but according to the promises and the faithfulness of God to meet their needs. And she feels this great desire or decision is made, in any case, on her part to return. The word return is very important in, in this. It's mentioned again and again, return. 
It's the, actually the same word that the prophets used over and over again for repent. So a lot, lot is left to our own kind of imagination here. Um, did this tragedy strike because they had left the land of Yahweh, the, 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 the land left the people and went to sojourn for a while in a foreign place and take foreign women as wives? The writer doesn't really say, but what it does say is that she heard about the Lord visiting his people and having mercy on them, and she, she decides to return. Verse 7, she's returning, she's going back. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on their way to return, there it is, to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return. So she's telling them, see, they're accompanying her back. She's telling them, you go and return, each of you, to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant you that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And just so, by the way, when it says they lifted up their voices and wept, that's exactly what it means. It doesn't mean just a tear trickled down the cheek, a silent tear. No, these women lifted up their voices and they, leapt and they wept loudly. Here were three widows joined together, as it were, in grief and in mourning. Each one had lost their husband. Because Naomi had lost her husband and her sons. But here these three women, women were lifting up their voices and weeping. And Naomi is telling them, go back, go back. And they said to her, verse 10, no, but we will surely return with you to your people. So initially, both of them are, are sort of committed not to let Naomi go off on her own, but they were going to accompany her back to her people. Verse 11, but Naomi, Naomi said, return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they are grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you. For the hand of the Lord has gone out, gone forth against me. So she's telling them in very strong terms and really sort of exaggerating the position somewhat. So she's making herself very, very clear what these two Moabitess women should do. They should turn around, go back to their own people. Go back to their own house, their families, and go back to their gods. And she makes a strong case, perhaps exaggerated as it is. She said, she, she was saying, look, there's no hope for you back where I'm going. Um, the chances of you, of you getting a, a husband there is, is next to nothing. There's nothing for me. What is there going to be there for you? And then she, she has this uh, scenario, are, are, you, are you going to, um, you know, even if I did marry, which is... Uh, Extremely unlikely. Would you wait until I had sons, until they'd grown up and they marry them? No. Every single question she asks, she expects an answer of no. These are rhetorical questions, all of which call for a response of no. No, they're not going to wait. Um, it's, she's, make, she's making the case very, very clear. Go back, my daughters. Go back. Return. Return. For it is harder for me than for you. Or that, that verse could be translated, it, it's, it's more, my, my hardship is more than what you will be able to bear were you to accompany me back to my people. And then we have it again in verse 14. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. So again, just picture Naomi, Orpah, Ruth, mourning loudly, weeping, at this, at this, what seems to be a parting of ways, Naomi to go this way and the two women to go back 
to their own people. And, and no doubt that an attachment had been formed, and there's a sadness. There's a sadness here. There's a grieving here of these three widows. And so let's continue. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, and Orpah goes back. But Ruth clung to her. Now let's just stop and think for a minute. Because there's something very unexpected here. You see, what we, what we would expect, after all that Naomi said and the pictures that she painted, we would expect both of the women to kiss her and to turn and to go back home. Find husbands, establish themselves there among their own people. That's what we would expect. But what do we see? Everybody's looking at the scene now. We see one of them going. And the other one clinging to Naomi. And the other, her name is Ruth. And perhaps Naomi thought, okay, she's sad. We, we've grown attached. We've been very close. But, but she will go as well. I think, I think Naomi expected both women to go back to their people. And, and you know, if we, if we, what we would expect is then to see Naomi walking off alone, head down, bowed down because of grief, tears streaming down her cheeks, bitterness in her heart, and just forcing them one step at a time making that journey one step at a time back to Bethlehem. So that's what, that's what we expect. One women, woman going this way and the two, tears also down, falling there down their cheeks but going back home. That's what we would expect. That's not what we see. Verse 15. Then she, Naomi, said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Verse 16, But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. Now, you know, there, there, there's, something, there's something special about this Ruth. Something very special about this woman. And the words which, which I'm about to read in verse 16 are, are among the most memorable words in, in all of Scripture. You couldn't find a greater words of commitment that you have in this verse 16 and 17. They bring tears to my eyes. They are spoken. They're, they're so rich, so, so, so powerful. And, and if you want an example of commitment and loyalty, you can't find better words than we read here spoken from the mouth of Ruth. Let's see what she says. Verse 16, But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse... If anything but death parts you and me. That, that is the kind of commitment that every single one of us should make to, to God, to, to the Lord Jesus. You know, she, she was burning bridges behind her. She was saying, there's no, for me, there's no going back. I am with you. I am not going to let you return on your own, but I will be with you every step of the way. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Listen. Listen to Ruth's words. She even bound herself with a curse. And it was a common curse. We find that type of curse, that, that wording, elsewhere in Scripture. May the Lord do to me and more besides if I do not do what I'm saying, what I'm committing myself to do. It's absolute 100% commitment she's made to Naomi. Not to leave her, not to abandon her. 
but to be with her. She, you know, she, she goes to, where you die, I will die. That's where I will be buried. But listen to this. Not only your people will be my people. She, she was coming to the covenant people of God. And she said also, your God will be my God. She was uh, leaving her family, her friends, her people, her, her, her gods, and she was coming to the God of Israel. This is a crossroads. This is, this is a time of decision for Ruth. What, was she going to follow Orpah and go back, or what's she going to do? And with these memorable words, she makes abundantly clear that she's going to go with Naomi, and she no doubt heard of the God of Israel through her. And she wanted to commit herself to, to come to a, to a new land, Yahweh's land, to his people. And she would be his, her God. So Naomi realizes uh, that there's nothing more she can say. So the picture we now have is two women walking a step at a time, downcast, tears, and bitterness, but especially Naomi. Uh, let's look at um, verse 19 now. So they both went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they had come to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred up because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? Just pause for a second. I just wonder, you know, we, filling in sometimes, um, you, you do wonder what must have been going on in the, in the minds of these women, especially back at Bethlehem. I wonder if there's anything of Wow, how things have changed. You left during the time of famine. Full, husband, two sons. You left thinking to, to, to gain what you needed for yourself and your family. We stayed here. We didn't leave. We stayed here during the famine. We toughed it out, trusting in our God. And how things have changed now. Those who stayed, now there's, there's provision. Now the famine is over and the blessing of God is coming. And here, here the one who had left... She's coming back empty, as she herself puts it. Have a look. Listen to her words. So all the city is stirred up. Isn't this Naomi? Maybe because of being so downcast and so depressed, they'd hardly even recognize her. But there's excitement. There's a stirring. Is this Naomi? In verse 20, she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. The name Naomi means... Um, Sweet, pleasant, or my pleasant one. The word Mara means bitter. She, she had a self-chosen uh, change of name. Don't call me Naomi, she said. Call me Mara, bitter. Why? Because the Lord, Yahweh, the Almighty, has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has witnessed against me, and the Almighty, that is El Shaddai, has afflicted me? Notice she never stopped trusting in the Lord. She never stopped um, speaking his name. And also she's really expressing her belief in his sovereignty. The sovereignty of the Lord behind all things. Uh, verse 22, So Naomi returned, and with her Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, just another quote from the same person before. He says that when I, when he, this man says that when uh, Naomi said, I came back empty, she's not giving much regard to Ruth at all, who's right there by her side. In fact, you know, you, we don't like to speculate, as you know, but it could be she really wanted Ruth to go back. Because bringing Ruth with, or having Ruth come along with her, there was going to be a constant reminder of what transpired there in Moab. And there was nothing but bad memories, death, tragedy. Um, and here, here she's got this Moabitess woman. Maybe she was even an embarrassment that all she comes back with is this foreigner. So her own words are, I went away full, but I came back empty. It's almost like Ruth is right there by her side is nothing I came back empty. I came back with nothing. Well, hang on. You've got Ruth right there by your side. But she doesn't seem to um, acknowledge that. This writer says, The word empty values her loyal daughter-in-law as nothing, perhaps even an embarrassment. The one remaining evidence of her entanglement and 
look at our tragedy with Moab. In any case, they come back at the time of the barley harvest. So the first chapter ends on a note of hope because harvest is a time of in gathering, isn't it? A time of hope for the future. Well, in chapter 2, enter a man named Boaz. Boaz. He's a very impressive man. He's a man of standing. He's a highly respected man. He's a property owner or landowner. So he's a man of high standing and, and it seems wealth and reputation. Not only that, he is a relative of the deceased husband of Naomi, Elimelech. He's a relative, very important as the story unfolds. So this, uh, he's, he was a devout man. He was a man who cared to, about those uh, servants who were um, working in his land. He, he, was, he cared about the law. And look at his very first words. Um, just to fill in some of the story, uh, so R Ruth and Naomi are back there, but what, what are they going to live on? What are they going to do? Well, it's harvest time. During harvest time, everybody works. You don't sit around during harvest time idly, not do anything. You work. Now, perhaps Naomi was just too old, or maybe she was just too down, too grieving, too depressed. But, but uh, Ruth says, may I go out into the fields and glean uh, after the, um, in the time of harvest. So she goes out, and it says that she just happens to come to that portion of the field owned by Boaz. Now, this is very important. She just happens. See, there are many fields. Here's Bethlehem. She could have gone that direction. She could have gone north. She could have gone this way. And even wherever she found herself, there would have been fields were divided up. Uh, there's different portions belonging, and they were marked off by uh, boundary stones to, as, to identify the owner of the property. So she came to a portion of the land which happened to belong to Boaz, who happened to be a relative. Now, of course, we know nothing just happens. This is God looking after it. This is God intervening for his people in this situation. So she, she, doesn't, she didn't just happen to go to such a place to glean, that is to gather um, from the, um, the harvest. Um, so here's God as it work. Now, let me just explain. Let me stop and just explain to you city dwellers a little bit about this um, uh, process that was going on here. And I'm a city dweller, lived in a city all my life. But basically what was going on here, that out in the field, men would cut the grain with a, a sickle, and the women would bind the sheaves, and anything that was left over would be picked up by the gleaners. Okay? So it's quite a community effort. Everybody involved, men, women, probably children out there as well. It was hard work. You're out there in the hot sun. You're laboring all day long. Backbreaking, difficult, hard work. And Ruth wasn't afraid of going out there and doing some hard work in the hot sun. But, you know, this, this occurred to me that not only was it hard work, but also uh, it could have been a wonderful time of fellowship, especially when it came to that midday meal. Stop the work. Come and let's refresh ourselves with a very precious water which had to be drawn from the well, have a meal together, and talk and converse, rest. What a time of bond, bonding of the community. What a time of fellowship, unless you were a foreigner. Because if you're a foreigner, you know, everything is going to seem strange. You know, where do you go? What do you do? Who do, who do you talk to? When it comes to that meal, where do you sit? Um, you, you're very much aware that you're an outsider. You're very vulnerable. And Ruth was in that situation. She was very vulnerable. This tells me a lot about this very special woman, Ruth. One, she was willing to work hard. Two, even though she had this sense of alienation as a stranger, you know, what, what do I do? Where, where do I go? Who do I talk to? You know, imagine, imagine this. I don't know if you've ever been in this kind of situation where... You just feel totally um, alienated from everyone around you. Imagine you just go to a new country. You're just a young person in your first day at school. You don't know anybody. You know, you, you, you barely can, can talk and everything is strange. You don't know where to go, what class. And then it comes to lunchtime. 
and you go in the, in the line and you, and you get your lunch and there you are and you're looking around in the lunchroom and everybody's there seated in their friendship groups and they're all talking, laughing and you're standing there with your lunch. Where do I go? Where do I sit? You know, so, so you go to find a place over there in the corner. There's an empty table and you take yourself over there and you sit down and you eat your meal alone. You know, you, you're vulnerable. This is the way it was for Ruth, even, even much more so. She was a stranger in, a stra- in this, to what was her, a strange land. Um, she expected nothing. In a sense, she, she, in her vulnerable state, she had no right to expect anything from anybody. Not only that, there was danger here. Now, as we, we see, Boaz was a good man. He was a good and devout man. And he looked after her and he cared for her and protected her. But not everybody was that way. Uh, There was danger for her, because when we read in chapter 2, verse 9, we read that Boaz says, um, Let your eyes be on the field which they reap, and go after them. Indeed, I have commanded the servants not to touch you. See, see, being a foreign woman, she she was, and and actually there's a danger for her. Um, And later on in the same chapter, we read uh, in verse 22, when she goes back home to Naomi, verse 22, Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his maids so that others do not fall upon you in another field. So you put all these things together. There was this Ruth out there working hard with the rest of them, vulnerable, in sense of danger. Not everybody was upright and would have done the right thing. She, she could have been attacked. Now, now also just notice Boaz's kindness, kindness, Her, his protection and his provision, and his comforting words. So, so basically Boaz comes and you notice the very, the very first words that, uh, that are come off of, uh, out of his mouth when we meet, meet this wonderful man. The first thing he says to the, his servants, he says, may the Lord be with you. The name of Yahweh, the God of Israel, is on his lips straight away. And so straight away we know something about this man. What a greeting. May the Lord be with you. And how do they respond back to him? May the Lord bless you. So, so Boaz then said, who, who is this woman? Who does she belong to? How could it be that there's this woman out there in the field? And so the servant who's in charge of the workers tells him who she is and how she's been working hard all day. Now let's, let's look at uh, chapter 2, verse 8. So Boaz goes and talks to Ruth. He said, Listen carefully, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go on from this one, but stay here with my maids. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Indeed, I have commanded the servants not to touch you. When you are thirsty, go to the water jars. Water is precious. You're working in the hot sun. You need water. And water wasn't, it wasn't just a tap, you turn the water on. It, the word, water had to be drawn from the well and it was precious. He said, make sure you get the water from the water jars and drink what the servants draw. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Verse 11, Boaz replied to her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me. And how you left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and came to a people that you did not previously know. Verse 12, may the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. Most beautiful words, most comforting words. In fact, that's what uh, Ruth's response is. She said, Verse 13, I have found favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and indeed have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. She she was so keenly aware of her her difference that she was different from the others. But just think of the comfort of those words to such a woman in such a situation. And oh, words can be so comforting. Words can be so encouraging. Encouraging. They can be so uplifting. Words can be so cutting, so hurtful, 
so devastating on the one hand, but words can be so comforting. And the words that came out of Boaz's mouth comforted this, this widow, this foreigner working there in his field. Well, of course, all this time, she didn't know that he was a close relative. Okay, let's, let's continue on. I know we're, our time is cut short. Um, so there was, there was uh, Ruth. She continues to work. She had her meals. She, not only did she have her, me her meal, but she, she took extra to, to bring it back to Naomi. She was going to care for her needs. There was Naomi still at home, probably very depressed, very down. But when, when Ruth comes back to her and tells her what transpired, Naomi says, Who, whose field did you work in? And she said, oh, Boaz. Now look, look, at, look what happens. Naomi comes to life. She's not bowed down anymore. Something stirs within her because she knows, ah, Boaz, he's a close relative. He's a kinsman redeemer. He was a goel, a kinsman redeemer. Moving on to chapter 3. Again, for all you city people out there, I'll just explain it to you so you can understand after har harvesting comes winnowing and threshing. So what is winnowing? That's the separating of the, chi of the chaff from the wheat. Really, it's nothing more than just kind of tossing it up so the wind can take away the chaff. So what is left with the wheat? And then the threshing at the threshing floor is the beating of the seeds out of the grain. Now, uh, Naomi begins to form a plan. She tells Ruth about it. And this is what happens. Uh, there's uh, Boaz at the threshing floor, and he sleeps there, um, perhaps to protect his, his grain. In any case, uh, he has a meal, he eats, he drinks, and he goes to lie down at his, his own threshing floor near one of the stalks of, of grain. And Ruth comes to Boaz, uh, following Naomi's instruction. She comes to Boaz at night, when there he is, that's stretched out, sound asleep. Now, the writer is very careful, very careful to make it clear that nothing improper takes place. Nothing improper. It's a, it's a, it's apparently, it's a custom which is going on here which we don't really know about and it seems strange to us what, what takes place. You know, because we're living, uh, what, uh, 3,000, 3, uh, over 3,000 years later in Sydney, Australia. We're a long way from Bethlehem. But nevertheless, this, this is what took place. And the writer tells us nothing improper happened. And Boaz, when, when she leaves him at night, is very careful that, so that nobody sees her. Because even though nothing bad took place, people will talk. You know, people do talk. But let's, let's try and get a hold of this. She comes to him at night. And let's see what she says to him. He wakes up in the night and he finds a woman at his feet. My goodness. So we're up, where are we up to? Chapter 3, verse 9. Well, let's go to verse 8. It happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and bent forward, and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. Verse 9, he said, who are you? She was probably completely covered, also her head covered, probably against the chill of the night. And, uh, but, but she was dressed in her best clothes, not mourning clothes any longer, her finest clothes. Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maid. Let the plane pass. Because you must hear these words. I am Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid. For you are a close relative. A kinsman redeemer. A goel. Okay, you've got this scene in your mind. Spread your covering over your maid, for you're a close relative. In other words, she's speaking of marriage. And Boaz, rather than rebuking her or speaking harshly to her, blesses her. Boaz blesses her and gives her provision, even more provision, and, um, and she gives him his promise to do as she asks. 
But there's a problem. And we don't need to go into this in detail. There was a problem. There was another relative who was even closer than he was, a closer kinsman redeemer. And so this is something that Boaz is going to have to deal with if, if he's going to be true to his promise to her. Anyway, Ruth, Ruth goes back to Naomi, full, absolutely full, as much uh, grain as she could possibly carry. And she's back to, back to Naomi, tells, her, tells Naomi everything that happens and gives her all this abundant provision. It's almost like a, a, a down payment or a foretaste of what is yet to come. Now, we come to the last chapter. The last scene of this drama is held at the city gates. The city gates. Now, the city gates is where, they're, um, where the business, the legal matters were uh, discussed and decided. So here we find Boaz at the city gates, and we can see that he's a man of authority because he's calling the shots. He's, telling, he's kind of organizing, orchestrating the whole thing. He finds this uh, one who's a closer redeemer, brings him. He calls the elders, gets them seated, and he begins to speak. Well, just to be brief, he had to give way to the one who was closer, and there was land involved as well. So what, what had to happen was that the closer redeemer had to not only buy the land, but marry Ruth and raise up a, an heir for the dead Elimelech, so that his name would be wiped, not wiped out and he would have an heir in Israel. Um, so here's Boaz in charge. He's a man of authority. Let me just explain again what's going on here. Whoever bought the field had the duty of raising an heir for the dead man. Now listen, if a son was born, the field would revert to, to this son. And so the Goel, the, the kinsman redeemer, would have impaired his own inheritance because his sons would not have inherited what he bought. And so that's why the one who was closer, first he wanted to buy the land. But when, when the, he realized that he had to marry uh, Ruth as well, he said no. And so that left it open for Boaz to fulfill that commitment, that role of the kinsman redeemer, not only to purchase the land, but to marry Ruth. Okay, that's, that's the drama. That's the story. And he did. He married Ruth, and they had a son, a little baby boy called Obed. Obed. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, I don't know what you're thinking. But you might be thinking, yeah, that's a nice story. It's a little story, and it's a happy ending. But I just want to say, there's a little bit more to it than that. Because this little boy, Obed, he was actually known, he would actually become known as the son of Elimelech, who has died, because, and um, he would therefore perpetuate the name of the, of the man who was deceased. And it was Naomi that took him and would, would nurse him. But as we come to the ending of this book, we, we see something, and perhaps why the whole book was written in the first place, or why the story was there in Scripture. See, Obed grew up, and he had a son named Jesse. Hmm, okay. And Jesse had a son. Well, actually, Jesse had many sons. Tall, strapping warriors, fighting men, handsome men. One after the other after the other. Jesse had many sons. And then finally he had his last son, David. And so there we go. The, the, the book bursts its horizon and stretches out into the future because when we hear that Ruth had Obed, Obed had Jesse, Jesse had David, and all the things that we think about and associate with David, that little, that little shepherd boy who, who began, being the youngest, was sent out there to care for those few sheep in the wilderness whom God took from there from, from caring for those sheep and made him shepherd of his people Israel. And he became the greatest king of Israel. Not only the greatest king and the, the writer of so many of these psalms, but all the promises that God made in connection with David and the house of David. It's of the utmost importance. King David and his house and his descendants who became kings after him. And so you know the story. We don't need to relate the whole story. Um, David had a son, Solomon. Solomon had a son, and during that son's time, the kingdom was divided. 
And the people uh, uh, rebelled in spite of the words of the prophets. And one was taken into captivity of Syria and one to Babylon. But God graciously brought his people back. And so the generations go and the generations go. And we come to the New Testament and the book of Matthew. And the book of Matthew starts with the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And whose name do we find in that genealogy? Ruth. Ruth is there in the, in the opening books of our New Testament. So we're brought, yes, it's a nice story. It's a lovely story. It's a heartwarming story. It's kindness in it. Kindness of Ruth to Naomi. The kindness and protection of Boaz to Ruth. The kindness of God over all of it. But there's much more than that. It's the line of David. It's, it's, it's the line through which Messiah, the son of David, would come. And he would be the redeemer, the kinsman redeemer of his people. And there we find in that genealogy, Ruth. And let me just say in passing, I know my time is probably up. Yes, probably. The time is up. <laughs> um, not only do we find Ruth's name, but we find a couple other interesting names. We find the name of Rahab. Boaz was a, was an ancestor, was a, was a descendant of Rahab, the, the Gentile woman whom, whom uh, welcomed the spies in. And there was another woman that there mentioned, Tamar, another Gentile woman. And then we have this third Gentile woman named uh, Ruth there, all mentioned in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is of tremendous significance. So, so Ruth points his, points his way not only to, to the future of King David, but all the way down the generations to the, to the greater son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, actually, Ruth, Ruth ends by looking back to the, to the patriarchs because the blessing that people give to Boaz, they say, may she be like a Rachel and Leah who established the house of Israel. So there's a link to the past. You know, may you be fruitful like, like Rachel and Leah. And there's a, there's a point to the future, to King David and beyond, to the, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, in, in finishing, I just want to... I guess, further draw out three things. So if you can bear with me, three things to draw out. Mention a few times the Goel, the kinsman redeemer, uh, the one who, who stepped in there on behalf of the one who had died, uh, not only to purchase the land, but to marry the widow and raise up a son for the one who's deceased, thus perpetuating his name. Well, as soon as we hear that word kinsman redeemer, we must think of the Lord Jesus, who is our redeemer, who steps in, who intervenes on our behalf to purchase us, to set us free, for, to, 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 to bring us forgiveness and cleansing, to, to bring us to himself and to the kingdom of God, of the God of his Father and our Father. So the kinsman redeemer. Secondly, this word covering. There's something very beautiful in here, which I don't know if you noticed. And that is the words of Boaz when he said, when he, when he speaks to Ruth and he says, you know, may God bless you. The God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. Under whose wings. You know, I, I marvel sometimes, you know, there's nothing to me that more perfect in nature than a bird's wing. You know, for, for flight, you know, don't, don't get me sidetracked, sidetracked here, but a you know, bird's wing is perfect. For, you see these birds darting around. They're masters of the air because of their wings. But not only that, the wings in this context is providing uh, protection for the little ones. Imagine the little chicks running around and, and a predator is there and they come scurrying to the mother. As Jesus said, you know, as a, as a mother hen, I would have gathered you under my wings. And so the, under the wings uh, of mother hen, they're, they're, they're hidden, they're protected. Uh, they can't be seen. They're safe. They're warm there. And, and Boaz says, the, you've come to the God of Israel and you found, sought refuge, refuge under his wings. Okay, that's interesting. But then when Ruth comes to him at night and she says, spread your covering, guess what? It's the same word, wings, that Boaz used earlier. Spread your wing over me. Cover me. Cover me because you are my near kinsman. And this is what we say 
Oh, this is what God has done. He covers us. He covers us with his wing. He covers us with his protection. We find refuge under his covering. And not, we can, this is, this is, um, this is part one of the next sermon, perhaps. But covering is so important. Uh, there's, there's, there's covering that God provides in the church. Uh, the, the pastor and the leadership provide cover, covering for the church. You know, the leadership, even with all their faults and all their weaknesses, it's something that God places in a church and there's a covering over them. We in this church are still trying to come to terms with that. Have some patience with us, please. We are still trying to sort out what it is going to be like, how we can have this covering that the leadership should provide for the church. In the home, the man provides the covering for the family. Being the head of the house, he's the covering for that family. There's a covering, there's a protection. And, but over it all is the covering of our God who covers us, who protects us. And my last and final point is the word kindness. And I'm going to close with these words. Kindness is a key word in this book of Ruth. Not only does it occur again and again, um, but, but it, it just uh, it kind of illustrates the outworking of kindness. The, the Hebrew word is chesed, chesed. One of the most beautiful words in Scripture. Kindness was shown, as I said before, Ruth to Naomi. Boaz to Ruth. Uh, Ruth, first of all, to her husband when they were alive, uh, but also now to Boaz. And, and there's, this, there's this recurring theme of kindness, hesed, hesed. Sometimes translated mercy, sometimes kindness. But I just want to say that kindness, in a way, perhaps is not a strong enough word. Because we, we might tend to, if we just think of the word kindness, we might make it a little bit too sentimental is if it's just a kind of a nice feeling, which you show kindness to somebody in need, and then after that you, you don't have any more to do with them, and they go their way, you go their, your way. Not so the kindness of God. And so in, in the English language, there's something very beautiful, uh, a beautiful translation of that word. There's the word kindness, and the word loving is put in front of it. So we have really love and kindness joined together, in this, the most beautiful English word, loving kindness. And that captures it probably very well because love, love, it's been said, is stronger than kindness. In the book of Song of Solomon, love is stronger than death. Love is strong. Um, whereas uh, in some people's mind, kindness not, might not have that level of strength. But you put the two together, chesed, loving kindness. And this is what we have from God, our Heavenly Father, um, portrayed again and again in, in, in this family as we focused in on this family in the book of Ruth. But what it, what it should start, get us to think about is the kindness, the loving kindness of God in what he has done for us to redeem us for himself, that we would be his people, his own possession. I'm, I'm finished now, but it's worth pausing and saying, me, this... This, this sinful rebel, go my own way, do my own thing, utterly selfish, immoral person. He has bought me with his loving kindness. He has shown his loving kindness to me to make, him, to make me his own. May all glory and honor go to him. Father, we thank you for your word and, and in the book of Ruth. We know that it is, it is in your pages of scripture for a reason. Lord, we know that you want to teach us and instruct us. Help us to think about these things, meditate upon them. And Father, my prayer for myself and uh, all of us here and our families, Lord, that you would cover us. Lord, we would find refuge in the shadow of your wing. Lord, we would be made your own special people. Lord, bought with the blood of Jesus, washed with the blood of Jesus, that we would be with you now and for all of eternity. Lord, because you are our kinsman redeemer. You have loved us with an everlasting love. Lord, be with each one here. I commit them all into your loving hands. Pray for your divine blessing according to the need of each one. For we pray this, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.